Hello and welcome to jasonnewland.com My name is Jason Newland and this is Let Me Bore You to Sleep with the sounds of a greedy little ferret munching away on his food after being out on a very damp walk and now he's proceeding to move some of that food around so he likes to uh, do little stacks of food around the place you know for those times when I just clearly starve him (laughs) so he's got something to eat He's actually doing that as I speak. He's grabbing bits and just, yeah, it's very weird. He's always got food available, always. So he's just done it again, just grabbed a bit of food and just put it over near my dumbbells. And then he's walked back He's done it again, grabbed another little bit of food. I should have filmed it for you so you could actually see it. Oh, he's done another, got another mouthful. Basically, he's grabbing chunks. And he's... I don't know what he's doing with it. He's just sort of stacking them. Probably save it for later or tomorrow morning. Anyway, uh, this is Let Me Bore You to Sleep. <laughs> if you're not already asleep, uh, the idea of this is to, first of all, only ever listen or watch. If you're watching on YouTube, only ever watch the video. If you're, if you're able to safely close your eyes, because this recording may cause tiredness due to boredom oh yes you hear the equa- the equational <laughs> equational you hear the occasional squeak of one's chair as one squeaks and leans backwards but uh, other background sounds I don't know at the moment it's mainly just Andre he's now in his carrier bag it's a next carrier bag and it's one of his favourite places to sleep. I think someone said to me online once said you should make holes in the bag, has make sure the holes the bag's got a hole in it. And it has, it came with a massive hole. It's the top. Huge hole. And uh I actually tested it with him once. I thought, well, he's got, f- ever since he's a baby, he's loved carrier bags and getting inside him and going to sleep and stuff. And I thought, well, I need to test that he can actually get out just in case he gets stuck. And I want to make sure that he can safely, you know, get himself out of a carrier bag. And so I did, I, I tied the, the top of a carrier bag and just put him down and chucked him in the sea, you know, I didn't. And I, I just, and I thought, I'd just watch him to see if he'd, if he, you know, how he'd get out. He was out of it within seconds. He's got these things called claws, which rip through a carrier bag very, very easily. And so... You know, we're talking about a ferret. They dig tunnels in the ground 
if they get an opportunity. He actually, when I first got him, bearing in mind that he was tiny, I put him into a cage because I, my friend gave me, uh, it's, it wasn't a big cage, but it's, it was big enough for him, for those two sections. And there, part of it was like a window, but it was a wired window. So it's, you know, it's wired in, like metal wire, but metal, hard metal that was securing it. Well, I heard scratching at the door. And this is only like a couple of weeks in of having him. I thought, how the hell is he scratching at the door? That's, That's not even possible. And he had escaped. He had eaten around the wire, ripped the wood out, and he'd also been biting at the wire and he pushed it. And he managed to push it all the way outwards and escape. So that's what he was able to do when he was a baby. Imagine what he could do now. Very strong. It's uh, those teeth the teeth that he has. He can. Uh, he's got this thing as well. When he gets something on his mind, he just can't seem to let it go. He just, you know, doesn't like closed doors. It's one of those things he just can't stand. Even if he doesn't want to go out, he doesn't want to go into the kitchen at all. Got no interest. As soon as I close the kitchen door, he has to get inside the kitchen. And he'll scratch and scratch and scratch and scratch and just continuously until I let him into the kitchen. He looks around and then he walks out again. He just has to have access to every room in the house. And he does, apart from the storage room. So he has access to four of the five rooms that I have here. The bedroom, the living room, the kitchen, and the bathroom. The storage room, the fifth room, is out of bounds from him. So yeah, I was just... um, I was thinking what I might do is get a wish list like an Amazon wish which which wish list for some books that I want I want to start getting my hypnosis and other book my collection I want to grow it and I'm probably quite old fashioned as in I prefer books like you know paperback hardback well, I prefer paperback really to hardback books but just books that I can hold in my hand and read uh, I've tried the Kindle I own a Kindle I've owned a few actually or two um, but and I've got books on there but I just it doesn't doesn't really suit my eyes so um and I have been listening to audio books the last month or two. But again, they don't have the, the books that I want. They have some of them, you know, like uh, some of the motivational stuff. I've been listening to uh, Wayne Dyer, Les Brown. So I've been listening to them too. Um probably going to get some Zig Ziglar audios as well but the thing is I can get that probably from YouTube and just listen to it on there but I used to own or you know pretty much quite a few, I think most of the Zig Ziglar book um, tape sets that he used to have I owned back in the late 90s and as well as you know, Anthony Robbins and uh, 
loads actually. The what's the name? Field of Fear and Do It Anyway. Um, who else was there? Uh, Ken Livingston, Seagull. Um, what was his name? The one that did the Seven Habits of the Seven, yeah, the Seven Habits bloke. So I listened to that, and I think was uh, I shouldn't. I'm not laughing at them, but there's this. Uh, speaking technique that they seem to take on and I've heard quite a few different um, speakers do it because I like I like um, I know what's the best word inspirational speakers rather than motivational I don't know if really I like the idea of motivate I don't really want to motivate people I like the idea maybe of inspiring people uh, from a perspective of um, yeah maybe instead of saying you can do it you can do it I like the idea maybe saying you know well perhaps you can you know instead of jumping up and down saying you can do anything you put your mind to, and ooh, jumping up and down, saying "Say I," put your hands up in the air, and all that kind of um, excitement. I quite like the idea of doing a more relaxed. You know, maybe, maybe you're doing okay as you are. Maybe you can build upon where you are now. Maybe you can get in touch with those things that you like about yourself. Focus in on that stuff and get to love yourself, get to appreciate who you are. So kind of a more relaxed. Is it safe to say the word grounded? Without sounding patronising? I don't know. Because I went to a seminar. Anthony Robbins. I went to an Anthony Robbins seminar. Uh, back in 19... No, it was 2005. I think. Might have been two two thousand and six. I think it was two thousand and five. And my friend gave me the tickets, and the seminar lasted, uh, I think, three days. I think. And my friend in London, he let me stay at his place for the three days, and he gave me the tickets. He gave his nephew the tickets, and also. There was uh, someone else that worked for him. They gave tickets to him, to her rather. So I met up with her. I didn't really know her very well, but I knew his nephew. I was friends with his nephew, but I only saw him on the last day, I think. Uh, Anyway, they, I think she was dating the chef in the club. But at that point, I hadn't been working at the club for a few years. So I kind of, I was still friends with the chef. But there was, I didn't know all the waiters and waitresses and all the bar staff anymore. Because, you know, over time, you know, if you leave, leave a job, you leave and you know everyone that works there. If you've been there for a while. But then... You go back in a few weeks' time, they're still all there. Go back in a few months' time, they might still all be there. You go back in a year, a lot of them might still be there, but there's going to be maybe a 
a new face, maybe a couple of new faces. That was a band, wasn't it? The new faces. And then eventually over time, which happened with that club, is nobody knew me. And I started working there again, uh, just helping out due, uh, for a little while in the office. So I kind of started getting to know some of the staff downstairs. And it was just weird, just weird. So it's sort of like, it's that, I don't know if it's uh, arrogance or just, maybe it is a bit of arrogance, but on my side, it was like, you know, I'd go into the club, say, you know, have a drink, please, and sort of maybe introduce myself as sort of, just like that part of me thinking, how can you not know who I am? But why would they? I don't work there anymore. (laughs) But you should know who I am. It's a weird human thing, isn't it? So yeah, I like the idea of maybe, oh yeah, okay, go, I'm gonna try and link back to what I was saying. So I went to the Anthony Robbins thing. And I, it was at the, I might be wrong, but I'm sure it's at a place called the Excel Centre in the Docklands, like East London, but it was a huge, huge venue. And he basically rented a room plus a lobby but that wasn't the entire centre that wasn't the entire venue but when I went in there it was huge and it held 10,000 people actually thinking about it that's the only time I've ever been in an audience that large. Yeah, I've never been in an audience with 10,000 people. I've been to theatres a few times over the years, but an average theatre would hold, at the most, probably 2,000. And that's a big theatre, would maybe hold 2,000. Some would hold a lot less than that. But this was... uh, It was just a big room with loads of chairs put down, you know, for people. Must have taken ages to set up. Although I didn't really think about that at the time. I sat at the back. um, Because... Or two reasons. I think I was there a little... I don't know. Why did I sit at the back? It's interesting, actually, because it's not interesting at all. It's boring, but... I sat at the back there, but when I did my NLP training, the very first day of my very first... um, it wasn't my first NLB training because I'd been doing it at City University in London in an e- evening course over, like it was back in 1998. So this was 1999 and it was, I don't even remember where it was. It was a big venue, but um, I sat right at the front. And that's the first time 
in any situation where I've sat at the front. I always generally sit at the back. Whenever I've gone to a comedy club over the last 20, 30 years, I sat at the back pretty much because I like to observe. I like to kind of quite like to observe the audience as well, just not to look at them, but just to sort of observe the behaviour and just the reaction and yeah so I um, I um, by the way I don't say every single thing that I'm thinking when I do these so if, if you hear me like have a little giggle it's because I've just thought of something really silly um, but sometimes I do say it Um, right I sat at the front of this NLP training and Richard Bandler came on stage and those of you that don't know who Richard Bandler is uh, he is the co-creator of NLP which is Neuro Linguistic Programming and before getting there I had already re um, read how many books quite, quite a few of his books I'd already read them if not all of them actually all of his books I probably read before I vis went to the training so there was something a bit special about I was going to say meeting. I didn't actually get to meet him because he's quite an. Uh, I found him quite aloof as a person. wasn't very um, I don't think he's a massive fan of people. I think he likes their money, but I don't think he's. Yeah, I don't. I just. It might have just been me, but at the time his wife was in a wheelchair and I helped him up some up a, a ramp or something actually one of the days and I don't think he even said thank you. She did, but I don't think he did. It was just it was I don't know. Not really sure what's uh Maybe if I'd worn trousers and pants, maybe that would have. Maybe he just didn't know where to look. Maybe because I kept flicking cigarettes at him when he was on stage. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't. Oh, weird thing to think. So. <laughs> God, I'd like to see a video of that. God imagine so someone coming in sort of saying how's Richard Bandler doing this like, where is he where is Richard oh he's there he's, he's underneath that big pile of uh, cigarettes oh no that probably wouldn't happen so when I saw Anthony Robbins and I notice in America, don't say Anthony, they say Anthony. 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 We say Anthony here. I've never met anyone that was called Anthony. It's, we don't, it's strange that we don't pronounce it. It's like Anthony Joshua is heavyweight world boxing champion or one of them uh, and he is you know he's, he's a big name in the boxing world he's English and 
So we call him Anthony Joshua. In America, it's Anthony. I keep calling him Anthony Joshua. And sometimes I tell a television, I say, no, it's just Anthony. He doesn't call himself Anthony. His mum might call him Anthony, I don't know. But he doesn't call himself... In fact, most people just call him AJ, which is more a sign of the times than anything else. It's... uh, I think we're getting very lazy when it comes to talking actually saying the whole word you know I can't say that it's got just let's break it down so it's easier AJ I'm not I'm not really very good with the whole uh, just you know like you know Facebook speech And even I go onto the bipolar forum on Facebook. What's well, a bipolar forum? There's probably quite a few. Uh, it's probably not called a forum either, is it? It's a. Uh, it's not a club. <laughs> it's a group. Yeah, group. So I go on the bipolar group. I visit it probably every day, every two days rarely contribute I just sort of read what other people have written and the amount of abbreviations that people use it's I kind of even I struggle sometimes like what 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 is it what are you abbreviating So BF is boyfriend. I don't know if I ever told you the story of an abbreviation. Topar, is it Topar, Potar, Topar, Tofar, Fotar, Potar, Fo, Fopar. That's it. So I've got a friend who is. It's older than me, probably about 10 years older than me, kind of. And lovely bloke. But he's, you know, just like me, he's from the the older style of abbreviation. And, you know, so things like PT... PTO, you know, if you're at the end of a of the page, please turn over. Um, or at the end, of a, you know, even text in LOL, lots of love. So you know that's what LOL meant back then. You know, not that long ago, but when texts first started. When people text each other, they used LOL as in lots of love. So this friend of mine didn't really, he didn't text mainly just to sort of uh, agree to meet up somewhere. So we want to meet up for lunch. Yeah, let's meet up at the graveyard. Oh, good. And we could, uh, quiet place to talk, isn't it? And we, you know, that was it up here. So I then see her. Hello, well. Lots of love. And uh, so, yeah, it just... It was from Scotland. That's not really relevant to the to the story, really. But he... Um,
So when my grandmother, well, basically, he, he, he sent me a text back in, it's a few years ago now, and he said, how you doing, Jason? Um, he might not have said my name in the text because why would you need to put someone's name in the text? They're the only one that's going to be reading it. I'm guessing. Unless you're one of those couples that uh, kind of mingle personalities into just one person and have to be with each other all the time and have to have the same conversation and talk on the phone together with somebody. My dad does that now. I phone him up on the house phone, on the landline, or even if it's the mobile, he puts it on a loudspeaker straight away. It's, there's, no, there's no private one-on-one -on -one conversations uh, allowed. And I've been caught out by that in the past. I remember I had a friend, and the amount of times she said to me, yeah, by the way, there's people in the car okay well maybe you could have said that before I said what I said you know you need to tell people it's uh, it's not a rule I mean there's no law but it's, it's a standard thing is if you go onto loudspeaker you tell the person you're with that you put them on loudspeaker it's the rule. It's it's, and it's not an unsaid rule. It should be a said rule. It should be a standard. It's it's just like I don't know. If you're under the bed covers together with someone. It's common courtesy to let them know that you're about to fart. It's just standard uh, for me. You know, not that I really spend much time. I mean, Andre, you should see him. Like, sometimes I fart and he's like... <laughs> he just really, just like... Sometimes he's actually ran out of the room. We're talking about a ferret. A smelly little poo bag. Honestly, I, I'm not even lying. I was in bed, and I let off. I like to let farts off in bed sometimes, because for a couple of re <laughs> couple of reasons, is I'm very relaxed, and sometimes I can get a really nice one going. Get it bubbling up first, you know, and just let it go off. Sometimes I like it if I can, you know, the, the duvet cover lifts up a little bit because of the fart. But it's, it's quite a nice uh, sound in my bedroom. And it also vibrates through the floor. Quite like that. Through the bed and everything. Anyway, I let off a fart. Andre was on the bed. I let off a fart. He shook the bed. He jumped off. A few seconds later, I can hear a, like a clear, like some some noise, and I look over. It's Andre. He's I couldn't believe it. He's only trying to open a window. It's just it's like what? Uh, anyway, so I went to this Anthony Robbins thing, and I was at the back, and there was the big screens, so I could see him. And he can talk, I tell you. Not just um, random stuff. He can talk and talk for hours and hours about stuff that's, you know, relevant to why people are there. And it's that's quite phenomenal, really. And he keeps the energy up. It's... So, yeah, that's... Um, quite amazing to see him in, in action 
and he's huge blood he's very tall big man and he's he has got the voice that kind of kind of a cracked voice so it's, uh, you can tell he talks a lot he but he talks loudly and the voice is very strained a little bit because of probably the amount of talking he's done in his life and um, yeah he's very tall very large mouth no he's he's got a lovely mouth I'm sure <laughs> that if sounds even worse doesn't it he's got a lovely oh I like his mouth no he's, it was it was good but I, I like the idea of a I don't know about inspiration if that's the right word because I don't think so if I was going to go on stage and talk to people I like the idea of doing it but I like the idea of doing it in a gentle relaxing way kind of like how I am when I do these I can't do motivational stuff because I'm not not particularly motivated myself I am but I'm not you know I'm kind of my life is evolves around doing this stuff doing these podcasts and you know that's kind of my what my life's evolved around but I don't I'm not like jumping up and down I don't jump out of bed every day and like American Dad you know the beginning of that good morning USA I got a feeling that it's going to be a wonderful day so I don't kind of jump up and uh, get all excited that it's another day I suppose I don't know it's it's just not how I am really it's not not knocking anyone that does that because it must be wonderful to to wake up feeling you know like it's you know have that feeling of actually thinking about it outside of Christmas possibly birthdays when I was a kid just thinking that there's one one morning that I remember feeling absolutely wonderful I was about 8 years old and my dad woke me up this is when I was living in the house where my nan and grand had moved into I've mentioned it in previous recordings so I was living in I was sleeping in the box room but I was only little and I had a picture of Bruce Lee on the right hand side um, from Enter the Dragon and anyway I was sleeping on the bed Saturday morning my dad comes in and says JJ no he said Jason uh, and he woke me up so it must have been agreed that, that he was going to wake me up at a certain time and I woke up and I remembered what today was and I hugged him and it's probably the the biggest hug I ever get gave him ever and I just felt full of love and happiness and the reason for it is because I had a date I had a date with a girl and we were going to go out and it sounds silly but I was 8 years old um, I know 100% because I, I was 9 when I, when I was 9 I was living in a different house so I was 8 and I might have even been 7 but yeah I was at least 8 so I went to this girl's house I'm not sure if she came to me or I went to her I gave her some chocolates so I got, I got a little box of chocolates to give her and we went to the cinema and watched 
it was a Saturday morning, we watched the premiere, because at that time they had uh, two films. They had uh, like a, or matinee, not premiere, matinee film and the main film. I can't tell you what the film was that we watched, because I don't remember. I don't remember. Ah. No, still don't remember. So, but I remember we went there, watched the films, two films, then came back to her house, and I met her mum and her dad and her brothers or whatever, and then we had some chips for lunch, so they gave me some chips, and then me and her went out into the garden, and we he, we hid underneath a table in the garden, and we had a kiss, and it was my f- very first kiss with a girl that I ever remember, ever. But don't remember it kissing anyone before that time. And I know it's young, but I was with someone. I guess she must have been seven or eight herself as well, same age as me. And I don't remember her name. I don't think we ever saw each other again. I really don't know. I don't know how we ended up going out. Maybe she. I went to school with her, probably. And I don't know. Maybe it just didn't work out because she she needed more of a commitment from me. I, I, I really don't know um, what happened. You know, I'm sure it was, it was her, not me, but I don't, you'll be cool, but I do remember feeling, it's probably the best feeling, one of the best feelings I've ever had, probably in my life, that excitement, that pure happiness, because I was about to do something that I was really looking forward to doing with a a girl that I really liked and I'd never been out on a date before I was about to do all this stuff that I'd never done before going out on my own with a girl going to the cinema and I don't know where that feeling came from but it was like proper strong really strong feeling of happiness and yeah but I don't get those kinds of feelings really generally I'm not really a big I'm not very excitable as a person I have been at times but generally quite a calm person and it's the little things that excite me sometimes yeah you know but I don't I don't make big plans and sort of get all excited about something that's going to happen in you know a few months time or keep talking about it and stuff like that and and I've been thinking about that because I've met enthusiastic people <laughs> and I um I struggle a little bit with people that are enthusiastic which is strange because enthusiasm is an amazing thing if it wasn't for enthusiasm we wouldn't have anything there would be no inventions at all so maybe it's not enthusiasm it's the excitability that comes with it maybe I don't know I've perhaps it's because I know that no one else is really too interested in what I do and I've accepted that and in some ways I've embraced that because then it's me it's you know it's like a 
it's a journey and it's a challenge you know but at the same time if I meet someone that wants to hear about wants to you know me to tell them about what I do I don't really want to do it it might sound really strange but years and years ago when I was back in 2006 might have been 2007 and I was uh, volunteering at this charity that was a an alcohol rehab like alcohol charity helping people alcoholics to you know reduce their alcohol levels and you know all everything to go with that and I was doing relaxation sessions group sessions there uh, a few times a week actually in 2007 and one of the counsellors I'd not met her before she was a new counsellor new to there not new as a new counsellor but she gave me a lift home and then she stopped she said oh let's just stop at the garage and I just got she said well I've got a couple of questions just really interested in what you do and she started bombarding me with questions like question after question after question after question after and I kind of just didn't see the point in it if, if that makes any sense like what, what what is the point in you asking me all these questions I didn't say that but I just you give me a lift home because she stopped halfway half through the journey I said I might as well just walk walk the rest of the way I think I did in the end I said I'm I'm going to just yeah I'm going to walk and I felt drained I felt oh so yeah, I'm not really, not really a, an answery person. <laughs> answery, I don't, I don't like being asked questions. Really, I went on a date once, and I met the person on Plenty of Fish. And we agreed to meet, and I thought, okay, why not? Just, just that's the whole point of the app, isn't it? The Plenty of Flesh dating app is to meet up with people. So that's for never met up with anyone before off of that app. So I gave it a go. And another situation, and it's, I'm not. I'm just saying, it's the it was just not my thing, not my way of communicating is she was just asking question after question after question and I'm not interested in my life I'm not interested in the past or I don't talk about it when I do these things but it's called let me bore you to sleep I don't find anything I say interesting it's just talking about stuff and I don't want to do that on a date. That's just boring. It's just to tell us to, you know, so it's on a first date, I mean. Over time, yeah, but not. I think it's nice if you're with someone and, you know, 10 years down the line, you're still learning new things about them instead of trying to get it all out on the first, you know, half an hour. for me really I don't really if I meet someone I don't I don't really have any questions for them really the only things that are really important is does she like me and that's that's kind of you know if she's single that's kind of it really and the rest of it just kind of comes along bit by bit the idea of like asking lots of questions 
Where are you from? What education do you have? What, you know, maybe what are you interested in? That's something. But... And the past. I don't really care about people's past. I think it's now, how they are now, what they're like now, not what they did in the past. I know that sometimes it's good to sort of discuss stuff in the past and, you know, but I think getting to know someone, it's it can be nice to get them to know them as they are now maybe it's just that it's kind of unusual because I think the the kind of person that I find the most annoying is someone like me because I know it's quite weird even though I'm quite slow when I do these things when I meet someone for the first time if it's a safe environment if it's if I'm in a good mood I can be quite bubbly quite full of energy um very much contradicting myself, aren't I? But I think people think they kind of get the impression that that's what I'm like and that I would want to be, I'd want to meet someone else like that and spending time with someone like me would be a nightmare for me. I don't want to be with someone that's constantly chatting. you know, all the time. And that's why I kind of live a solitary life because I like the quiet. I like, that's why I like a television because you can just mute it. And I do sometimes, Some, sometimes I watch it. See, I was watching the, um, the Parliament channel earlier because they've been talking about Brexit and there was the vote thing went on and the, uh, all that stuff and I'm very politically aware at the moment in my country's politics more so than I think I've ever been I don't really know why but uh, anyway I there was a lady on there and she was doing a speech and they were all doing speeches but she she kept repeating herself uh, and she kept repeating the phrase not fit for purpose which is a very well if it was something that was used a few years back uh, a politician used the phrase not fit for purpose and then the newspapers picked up on it and everyone seemed to love that phrase a new phrase and then everybody started using it all the politicians started using it celebrities were using it TV, it was just like everywhere and now you can always tell a politician who's maybe not very confident within their own words or within themselves maybe maybe they're a new politician or they just don't feel very confident talking out loud doing speeches because they'll use all the same phrases you know the they'll just regurgitate the old sayings such as not fit for purpose and then this woman was doing this that's what she was doing this MP 
and she was reading it as well so she clearly didn't have a lot of confidence in what she was saying or she didn't maybe her memory went a bit or I imagine it's for some of them it's probably quite uh, difficult because they're being watched on television as well so you know you make one mistake and the whole country sees it <laughs> but she was reading this so she must have written down not fit for purpose I'm talking probably 14 times I think I heard her say it she kept saying it the government last year was not fit for purpose the government in January were not fit for purpose the government yesterday were not fit for purpose she kept just oh, I had to put it on mute I had to put the TV on mute it was a mutiny <laughs> oh. I staged a mutiny not fit for purpose oh it's one of the f one of those another one that just does me a little bit is when people say swear down okay it's not the politicians that say that because it's uh, usually younger people and swear down what's the new one now bruh so instead of brother or bruv it's bruh so I'm guessing if you short that it's boom, 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 I guess so maybe I could do a could do a little I thought about inspirational inspirational I've got bipolar but I've had uh, mental illness health issues you know since I was a child but I've managed to get through I'm 48 I've managed to help people around the world managed to find a purpose you know that's quite a kind of a success story in, in some ways but at the same time I can't go on stage and, and say you can have anything you want you can do anything you want because I'm not a living example of that I'm a living example of you can you can find something that gives your life purpose and finding something that gives your life purpose is the one thing that will keep you alive the one thing that will get you out of bed and my experience is the one thing that even when it disappears at times it still comes back never goes away forever always comes back it's kind of like a do you know the things what you can get and I'm going back years isn't it really weird it's so long since I did this I used to when I was at school I had swimming lessons and one of my schools actually had a swimming pool in it which is pretty groovy isn't it it's a quite an unusual thing I think and I had swimming lessons and I you know those boards that you just hold on to and you can swim with them. You can hold on to them and swim, or you can put them under your under your stomach, under your chest. You know, you can you know pretty much you can play around with them as well. Put them between your legs, and sort of you can balance so it keeps you above the water, basically. So as long as you're holding on to those boards, I remember it was blue. I think the one I had. They're not necess They come in different sizes, but I think the one I had was put it about a size on my head maybe a bit bigger and for you sort of say oh that must have been the size of a swimming pool then 
making fun of my head size is not nice, stop it. And so this board, which floated and helped youngsters, or and, our, and our adults as well, um, to keep buoyant. It was a buoyancy aid. Anyway, you know what we used to do is, I used to like to pull it under the water and then let it go and it would fly out of the water. So the further down I could get it and let it go, it would literally fly out of the water. And uh, that's a bit like what my purpose is to me. To have a purpose in life is sometimes the depression or the bipolar or life, whatever, pushes that buoyancy aid underneath the water, but then it manages to just free itself and it pops out of water. So it's always there, always keeps popping back. And as a buoyancy aid, it does just that. As a lifesaver, it does just that. So yeah, it's a nice little analogy, isn't it? Yeah, man. So I'm gonna go, I think that's me done for today. You take care of yourselves. And I shall speak to you next time. By the way, in the last recording, I said that my recordings, my MP3s will be available to download for one pound. I changed my mind and they're all free again. I didn't last long, did it? You take care. Bye.